So, um, first let me acknowledge uh, co-authors, uh, two that uh, Marla didn't mention. Uh, Mary Kozigli is a professor uh, and also in the Edmund Ford part of the course. Uh, and Leah Fortman is a uh, working master student uh, in our program and is now doing her PhD at Ohio State. So, um, as I was uh, preparing the talk and thinking more about what, what it is I wanted you to take away from this, uh, this, this talk, maybe I can point it this way in my head to get my screen for me. And I sort of thought I had four main objectives for what, what I would what, what I'd want to accomplish uh, tonight. So the first is really to raise awareness at a basic level, while the <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. So, okay. um, the first is to sort of raise awareness. You know, I think uh, Marla and Marla first uh, do a great job of mentioning this a lot, but it's not something in the field that um, is, is very well uh, thought of, which is that the health benefits are not necessarily um, the only benefits that matter to beneficiaries. And things like cancer are a neglected but very important category of benefits. So that's sort of the first uh, uh, objective. The second objective is to give you a sense of what a research project looks like in this sector. Um, and to give you a perspective of, of uh, it's not a bit pretentious, but a scholar. I, I, I'm not supposed to have a kick in the thing. I'm supposed to be figuring out what I think is really going on. And what I see as the role of research here is to try to turn uh, anecdotes into evidence, or, or to try to see what's an anecdote and what's an evidence, what's a pattern and what's a, a sort of status that one off for the anecdote. And I was thinking of this as well in uh, a great uh, editorial that Maya wrote in the city of Seattle a couple weeks ago. And I don't know if any of you noticed that there's a really interesting discussion. Uh, a series of people writing on and reacting to her op And it was, it was interesting because one person came on and said, Well, I have heard and I that sometimes people women will sabotage a water project because they actually enjoyed spending the time socializing and walking to, to get water. And that, that interaction and the discussion was very illustrative to me. And there was no such person in there that could possibly be true. That's wrong. Uh, but that only so I I heard that only say I think that it probably is true. But the clear is not just a one or two sort of anecdote thing or is that a pattern? And that's what we're trying to do and I want to illustrate that it's pretty difficult to do research in this field and to try to see uh, what are actually patterns. The third objective is to really highlight and applaud uh water first role in this project and the support for doing what I just said, trying to prove apart what is evidence. Trying to um, move beyond just sort of going with fluctuating conventional wisdom or fads in the development sector, which, if you know anything, is very, very common. People seem to swing around a lot, and I don't think that Waterford does it, and I appreciate it, and I want to highlight uh, their support. And also, their support for having a series like this, which is trying to have deeper conversations about these uh, issues. And fourth, so my fourth objective is to present some evidence. For an ongoing uh, project. So, as you said, we've uh, been doing field work in 2009 and 2010. We've had going back next week to start another five week period of research uh, this summer. Um, but we've also just collected a ton of data. So, the analysis is still uh, ongoing. Okay. So, time for tonight. Um, and let me say, I'm going to start the clock. Uh, I want to make sure people have time at the end uh, for questions. So, I'll try to leave at least 10 minutes for that. If you have any sort of large questions, I'd ask that you hold them to the end. If there's something that's confusing you about the research you're doing or a quick question that you think is a clarifying question, please do them in. And so I talked about half an hour, uh, maybe 35 minutes. So why measure time saving? How do you measure time in, in poor countries and why is that uh, a challenge? And it's a study that I research in the field here. So, so far, I'm in results. I got um, purposely hard and uh, spending less time in water collection. And um, about an hour less, about 5% of their, uh, their, their time budget. And that's a highly statistical significant event. 
What we're interested in more is where that translating is going. How are people spending that time? And that's so unclear. Um, and then there's just a lot of data for the MRI. Um, so we were approached to get a study. We were a cartoon that I think illustrates again the the anecdotes that I that I told and I I believe mostly true. I think that we want to figure out what the relationship is. Now, why why do we care about this? I don't try to read this. I know you can't read it. It's impossible to read. Uh, I will get out of my responsibilities. And that can go out. What this is, is it's a new table of cost effectiveness ratio. Now, what that means is in the health sector, which increasingly is a very, is, is, is the big player in the human development sector, this table lists all the different things that you might do to improve health. It's put together by something called the Disease Control Priorities Project. It's a volume about that thick on the shelf, and it's very influential. And what the, the color bars are showing, the different colors of different groups of interventions, and we're still using a dollar per benefit number. It's the thing called a dollar in this context. And what you want is you want more of the things on the bottom that give you ben more than per dollar. And you want fewer of the things at the top. So the ratios are farther to the right. Okay? So then this is very influential for me, I think, to guide uh, decision makers and investments in the sector. And I want to show you some of the diarrhea uh, related um, types of things. So here we are, hygiene information, very, very cost effective. One of the most cost effective things you can do. Um, there are things like HIV, malaria, et cetera, in here. And here's build sanitation facilities. Here's oral rehydration therapy. So as you're moving up the food table, we're saying maybe this is not such a great investment. Maybe you should be doing more of the things below. So how are vaccination? And the vaccines are going to start And here, all the way up at the top, is improved water supply. The salary is your, is your objective. The most cost effective way to do it is housing promotion. But the, the least cost effective is actually to improve water supply. And I'll show you this table to illustrate the fact that time savings is not in here. And if you ask households what the most important benefit is, very often people will tell you the first thing they'll tell you is convenient. The country, it doesn't enter into this cost effectiveness calculation, partly that's because um, it's hard to measure. So, just quickly, uh, a, a little conceptual model of how we think about time savings. So, what is the water project can save you both direct time, what we normally think of as, as actually carrying water, but it may also save you time indirectly. So, if the children get sick less frequently, you would spend less time caring for them. So, there could be indirect savings. We would think this could be uh, uh, impacts could be direct and indirect on men, women, and children. Um, there might be sanitation time savings. We're going to focus just on water supply, but it's not the only one of possibility that by bringing your cleaners closer to the household, moving people away from uh, open defecation in the fields, we could be saving them time. And another thing that's not in this conceptual model, but could be really important, is Suppose that the water point is an hour away. When I walk an hour, I carry a very clean back of two hours. Now, suppose you bring the, the point closer to me, and I think it's in the walk. I still might spend two hours a day collecting water, but I'll collect a lot more water. Right? I could make multiple trips because the other source is closer, because I can only carry one very clean at a time. That could be very important for health. Because as I'll, I'll show you, there's some evidence that um, when water is more convenient, people are more likely to use it for hygiene uh, and washing. So, um, what we're also interested in is not just um, the time impact directly on men, women, and children, we're also interested in whether it's reallocated within the household. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So I guess I'll probably go through a little faster just to save us a bit of time. Um, but I do want to show you, give you a sense of what I've done. I hate moving close for when I'm starting with that means I'm feeling really important. Okay. 
So here are the questions. How much time do you people spend collecting water? How much time do you water projects save? What do they use the time for? And is it reliable? And what I'm going to argue is the first question is the same as the evidence. The second question so, some evidence that, that generally weak or quality, and I'm just not going to answer it or to that question. Now, let's talk a little bit about how you measure time. How do you measure time? How do you do it in the U.S., for example, how do you take your hours to it? So, the first thing you can do is actually follow from the morning. Right? And then you click the road and you go and go right down with the room. You can all imagine where the problem is at. But there's a, a big tradition in anthropology of people, of people sort of moving to villages, being there long enough that people kind of forget where they are and uh, do direct observation of places. A new method, new in the last 20 years, is something called experience camping where your cell phone buzzes at random times during the day, and you have to send a text message back and say, here's what I'm doing. Uh, there's some sort of approach where you can sample things very throughout and sample the activities throughout the day. So it's pretty gold standard, and there's another one that seems to have you seen it in the papers two or three days ago, which is in the real terms on how the Americans spend their time. This is based on self secluded contemporaneous diaries. So you've got to pay people a lot of money because it's a real pain in the game to be paying this diary out every 15 or 20 minutes and saying what it is you're doing. And, and good ones will all have primary activities. It's the main thing you're doing. It's the second thing you're doing. It, is there a stuff I'm watching just as they're not socializing with my spouse, for example. Um, those require literacy. They require a sense of time. Um, you, you need to be in a culture where people are very familiar with the class and are, uh, are used to thinking in those things. These latter approaches are more used uh, in, in areas where that's not true or where diaries are too expensive. So you could have an interviewer walk you through the last 24 hours. So tell me about the last 24 hours and all the things that you did. Um, or you could say, tell me an average day. So on an average day, and you can think about this in your own life, if you're going to try to say, how many hours on an average day do you spend watching this week or watching television or working? Uh, and then think about how you might respond to an average day. And that's how you got to find to yesterday. Can you remember what you did yesterday? So that sort of suggests that there are problems with me called bias. Right? Even to think how much time did you spend watching television yesterday? Maybe that's easy. Um, but people have problems in time for as much beyond 24 hours. If there's an interviewer uh, in front of you, you may want to give them the answers that you're comfortable giving them and not give them uh, an accurate answer. So that's a problem. And then the one that we use is, is um, illiteracy and, and what I call numeracy or, or uh, um, intemporacy. Intemporacy is the word I would say. Which is uh, being in a culture where we don't live by the clock. People don't necessarily.